Dr. Brown, I am so thankful for you to be able to talk to me today and to be able to share. If, if I ever have any questions, you're my go-to. I always call you. I'm like, help me, you know, and you've been so gracious with me. And I just am so thankful for you, for what you do. Well, my, my joy to be here for you, man. My joy. Thank you so much. So um, I had made a video a while back and uh, I, I forget even the setting or the context of it. But it was on the, the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Um, I've, I've got the Amplified here. I've got the Passion. I've got the, I've got the, uh, the New King James. But the New King James um, would bring it. And, and it says this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I love the amplified it, it. It's, I mean, I like it. I love the adverbs. I love the adjectives. I love the, the long definition of it. I love the Greek and I love the Hebrew as well. But it says, for our sake, he made Christ virtually to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in and through him, we might become endued with, viewed as being in, and an example of the righteousness of God, what we ought to be approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. Um, and I, I won't read the passion. I, I, I'm, I go through lots of different translations. I love it. Um, but when I explained it, there were people that actually um, heard me saying one thing when that's not, a, that's not what I meant for them to hear. That's not what I meant to say. Um, and so basically, and, and we've gone kind of back and forth on this, and I've asked your heart on this very thing. Because to me, righteousness is the is the whole is the whole of what happened to me because of my life and this sin filled life. You as well had that same encounter. But my I was an addict. I was lost. I didn't believe in any gospel. I didn't believe in any Christianity. I thought all Christians were hypocrites. I thought that they used it for this weird crutch to get through life, just like a lot of atheists do. But for me, I was so horribly stooped in and steeped in sin. So for me, when I went to Teen Challenge and I had gotten shot at and, and I had that encounter with a voice that said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? I, I didn't understand how to reach him. He had already spoke to me, but I didn't know how to get to him. So when I went to Teen Challenge, I'd never read a book before because I had learning comprehension disorders and so when you open the Bible and, and you've never read a book before, it's definitely a different, a different kind of book. I mean, this is alive. The word's alive. So when I was in there and I'm, and I'm in the chapter of James, and I think I shared my first encounter with scripture where God revealed about lacking wisdom. Um, if I asked God, he'd give it to me. Um, well, they were talking about trials and I was so angry because they said, consider it joy. When you, when you face these trials. And I figured trials were being in front of a judge because I'm like this convict has been in front of so many judges, has been guilty every time, has did the crime, do the time. And I remember saying to God, I, I remember him saying to me, what if, I, in a still small voice, I didn't know it was his voice because it sounded like, a, it just felt like a thought that I was thinking. But the, the voice came and said, I said, I hate trials. And the voice said, that's because you're always guilty. And then I said, well, yeah, you do the crime, you do the time. And I'm basically arguing with this voice that, you know, in myself in the prayer closet up at Teen Challenge. And he said, what if I say, and I didn't know it was him. What if I say you're not guilty? And I said, well, that's just stupid because I'm totally guilty. I mean, I've done it all. I'm guilty because I did it. I did it. I'm used to going to jail or whatever and the fines, the, the court hearings. And he said, I say, you're not guilty. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's just crazy. Like, what, what is that? And then he said it again. And I said, wait a minute, hold on. Like, what do you mean I'm not guilty? I, I've done all this stuff. And, and the revelation, just real light flicker of light hit my heart that, wait a minute, like, is that God saying I'm not guilty? This is crazy. So I went right to a counselor out of the prayer room. I said, hey, tell me, tell me what this means right here. Just am I guilty or did Jesus make me not guilty? And they were like, well, technically. And I'm like, no, 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 don't technically. Am I guilty of all that I've done? He said, well, you did do it. I said, yeah. I said, but did Jesus pay the price 
to make me not guilty. And he just said to me, he goes, well, theoretically, I said, don't say theoretically, because I don't understand it. I'm a simple guy. Am I or am I not guilty if I believe that Jesus did what he did? He said, well, you're not guilty. I said, so you're saying to me that I am not guilty of all that I've done, that God literally would forgive and remove it? Like, because because if it's still there, then I'm still guilty because I still did it. So the blood of Jesus remove it or did the blood of Jesus just like wash over it? Tell me, help me. And so I'm trying to get people to tell me. No one can give me a straight answer. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I'm reading and coming and going after scripture. Now it's starting to make sense to my heart. And I, I go to Romans 5 and it says, therefore having peace with God because of the reality of justification being just, you know, being justified in God's eyes. And so the reality of righteousness started to hit my heart. And I was this guy that was running around telling all these guys that were just coming into Teen Challenge, you're not guilty, bro. If you believe in Jesus, he paid the price. And I'm this zealot, insane Christian. And I came upon this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it says that he who knew no sin became sin. And so all I knew was that Jesus became something so that I could become something. And I was just simply getting that much. And so the price, the penalty for all the sin, the sin that I didn't even, like that the whole world had committed was laid upon Jesus. And I know it now as like the scapegoat was laid the sins upon the scapegoat. And, and I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited because Jesus bore my sin. He bore my sin. All the penalty for my sin, he bore it on that tree. And he said it was finished. So with me, this scripture jumped out at me so much that Jesus was marred beyond any man. It says that he was, he was beaten, but he was marred beyond recognition. You couldn't recognize him on the tree, that he had become unrecognizable. And the Lord spoke to me and said, the reason why my son became unrecognizable on the tree is because you were no longer recognizable because of sin. So Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that I might become recognizable again, become the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. Not my righteousness, but the righteousness that he has paid a price for me to become, the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. So in when I'm trying to explain this in the video before, I said that Jesus, you know, literally became child pornography. But what I'm saying is he never committed a sin. So for him to have that upon him, we talked about this the other day, like he had it placed upon him. And so the weight of the sin of the whole world was placed upon the Christ, was placed upon this one that never sinned. He who knew no sin had every bit of that placed upon him so that I could go free and become the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. He didn't become somebody that molested a child. He didn't become that. I never said that. And I never meant for that to be said. I am just so thankful for the righteousness of God that I'm trying to find the best way I can to describe. You don't have to live in condemnation. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in regret for the things that you can't go back and fix because Jesus paid the price for you to be free from that, for your soul to be free so that you can understand what it means to approach the father and to boldly approach the throne of grace in time of need. And I see condemnation, guilt, and shame hitting the body of Christ in such a heavy way that we can't get past the things that God already did get past when we said yes to Jesus. And so it's, it's my highest priority to produce the soul, to, to help to produce in the soul of a Christian a condemnation-free zone to where they don't have to have, because if you're condemned, if you're guilty and you're ashamed, you cannot approach the throne of grace because you don't think you're worthy because there's no way that God's going to want to look at you. No, God wants to look at you, but he wants more than that. He wants you to look at him. And it's only through righteousness that we can look at him. So I'm, I'm trying to explain it in the best way I possibly can, but we don't have to live there. So Jesus did not become the active. He didn't become the sinner that committed child pornography. He didn't become the sinner that committed the thief, the, the stealing. He didn't become the rapist. He didn't become that. He became the penalty of sin on that tree. And I'm, that's the best way 
that I know how to explain it. But he never committed any sin. So he's fully God and fully man. But he, he had to do what he did for us to be free. So, yeah, help yeah, me. Yeah, so what I, I appreciate first, you giving your own spiritual history. And I remember the night that I was truly born again, looking for the guilt, thinking of things I had done that the spirit had been deeply convicting me of. And the guilt wasn't there. The guilt was gone. Yeah. Now, obviously, we, if we you know, stole money from our neighbor and we get saved and we get the, the money in our pocket, well, we return the money. That's but right. in God's sight, when we truly repent at that moment, yeah, we're, we're forgiven. It, it's Our sin is forgotten. It's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. So when you had made the statements you did on that video, I didn't see the video, but I had people say, well, you know, Todd White, he says he looks to you. He just said that he just said Jesus became a pedophile and Jesus became a child pornographer. So I asked you and you said, no, no, you would never say that or intend to say that. And then subsequently, when we talked and, and you explained, you know, looking at the verse and what does it literally say and what does it literally mean? So as we, as we talk this through, so we'll, we'll have now with everyone watching the same conversation, the, the key thing that's critically important to emphasize is, is that Jesus in his essential nature was always sin free. If at any point his inner being became polluted with sin, then he couldn't be God because God is, is always absolutely and totally separated from sin. So that's what people will hear and be scandalized by. Are you saying that Jesus in his essential being became sin or became a sinner? Well, obviously not, because then he, he wouldn't be God. That's right. And there is a heretical teaching that, that Jesus went to hell and in hell became a demonized sinner right. and then was raised up as a glorified man. Uh, and became God as a glorified man. I mean, that's a heretical teaching. So they may hear you say something and immediately jump to wrong conclusions. But here's what we know elsewhere, right? I mean, Paul's language is very strong. God made him to be sin who knew no sin. So he's saying he knew no sin. He himself never committed sin. He right. himself was guiltless and always essentially God in his nature. Uh, but what does Paul mean when he says he became sin? Some have understood it through the years that it meant he became a sin offering. The Greek can be used like that in the Old Testament translation of Septuagint, and that we know elsewhere, Paul says that, that Messiah died for us as a sacrifice, like 1 Corinthians 5, 7, or Romans 3, 25. So some have argued for that, but the argument against it is that the Greek word hamartia elsewhere never means sin offering in the New Testament. And the contrast seems to be clear in this verse that it's talking about he who knew no sin became sin. So the sin offering is possible, but it's not where most translators and commentaries go. So I want to read for everyone what Professor David Garland wrote in his commentary on 2 Corinthians, because he's a highly respected New Testament scholar. So he first goes through, does it mean sin offering? He says he doesn't think so. So this is what Professor Garland says. This is what you were trying to say, and it created a, a scandal to some. Yeah. Professor David Garland says, Paul, therefore, intends to say that Christ is made a sinner. The New Testament, however, proclaims that Christ was without sin. And he gives a bunch of verses supporting that. By metonymy, one thing taking the place of the other, using an abstract term in place of a more concrete term, and by saying it was for us, he protects Christ's sinlessness. Galatians 3.13 offers an important parallel. Paul asserts that Christ became a curse in order that blessing might come to others. This statement matches what he says here. Christ became sin in order that others might become the righteousness of God. Paul is not focusing on Jesus' human life, but on his, in, his inglorious death. Christ experienced the consequences for human sin. The one who lived a sin, sinless life died a sinner's death, estranged from God and the object of wrath. He was treated as a sinner in his death. Then Peter writes this. 1 Peter 2, 22 and following, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Then it says a couple of verses later, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And then in 1 Peter 3, he writes this, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The same as Isaiah 53, 6, 
all of us have gone astray, each one like sheep has turned to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So there on the cross, the ugliness of sin is demonstrated by the, the horror of the death. The penalty of sin is demonstrated based on the extreme death that Jesus is dying, the most barbarous and horrific that was known in the ancient world, naked, reserved for the lowest of criminals and, and, and treasonous. And, and then, in addition to that, mystically, he bears our sin in his body on the tree, just like the scapegoat would, would symbolically carry that sin. So he serves as that, that sacrifice of atonement taking our place. So he pays the penalty of sin. He takes our place in that sense, bearing our sins in his body on the tree. He yeah. becomes sin. He is completely identified with it and dies a sinful or a sinner's death that we now might receive his righteousness and God declare us not guilty because the price has been paid. The blood of Jesus, God's son, 1 John 1, 7, cleanses us from all sin. So Jesus, in his essential nature, is always the perfect, sinless, flawless son of God, right. the one who in his final words says, Father, into your hands I, com I commit my spirit, and dies perfectly pure, yet becoming sin, and that he takes our sins on his shoulders and dies for them and publicly epitomizes the ugliness of sin and the penalty of sin. And that's what Paul says there very concisely. And just as real as that was, and every Christian recognizes that was totally real, that's just as real when God declares us righteous in right. his sight, that's even right. though we haven't lived a perfect life. So and good. even though we haven't, look, look the, when God declared me righteous, I hadn't gone home yet and thrown out my needles and drugs. Yeah. I hadn't done some of the things I told the Lord I would do. But at that moment of truly turning in my heart, true repentance, truly asking for mercy, he declared me righteous. At that moment, if he addressed me, he would have addressed me as Saint Mike as opposed to Sinner Mike. At that moment, you know, as he does in the New Testament so to the Corinthians, called saints, called holy ones, and called to be holy. Now, because we recall that, we are now called to live it out. And last point, conviction says, you've sinned, come near me. This is God showing us as his children, or before we know him, we've done what's wrong, and he's drawing us to him. Condemnation says, you've sinned, get away from me. That's right. So we know no condemnation in Jesus. We know conviction, which is God lovingly correcting us and bringing us to him. Condemnation is you're guilty away from that. We do not have that sentence of doom on us as believers. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I think I just got born again again. I love it so much. Oh, my goodness. I love it. You know, when, when, I, when I got saved, I, I looked and I was studying the, the blood in Hebrews 9 and, and 10. And it says that, said that how much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse our conscience mm. from dead works in order to serve God? And so... I don't have to live with a sin consciousness because I can live with sun consciousness. I do not have to live with a guilty conscience because once I get convicted, immediate obedience needs to happen. Conviction comes immediate obedience. And when I always tell people, if you immediately obey, you will never make room for condemnation, guilt, or shame to touch you ever. Hmm. And, and you know, something else I think about on the holiest day I've ever lived since I've been saved, where I had the best time in prayer, the most focused time in the word, the purest of thoughts, the greatest love for my neighbor. I lived by mercy that day That's because exactly compared right. to God's holiness, yeah. we'd be fried. You know, the, the famous theologian R.C. Sproul used to give this illustration where he has someone representing Hitler on one side of the room and then on the other side of the room. So on the stage there, uh, the platform on the other side is Jesus, right? And then he has this person who's, born again, transformed. And he says, as far as life conduct, that person's closer to Hitler as a human being than to Jesus. Now you hear it, you think, no, no, that can't be. I mean, Jesus really does change us and we do become new creations. But to say it again, every day we live by mercy, not by our good works. So on my best holiest day, I'm not boasting in my righteousness. When I stand before the Lord, I'm not going to boast, look at what I did, no how many days I fasted, how many people I shared the gospel with? How, no. no, no, it's going to be by the blood of Jesus. That's exactly. So that's the way I live today. And that, it, that empowers me to live for God. That gives me a greater hatred of sin 
and a greater desire to please him. And, and, you know, when you know that high calling, what Jesus paid for us to become what God wants us to be, it's like, Lord, that's what I want. I don't want to live in the mud. I don't want to live in the muck. I don't want to live in that old fallen nature. I want to live in newness of life in Jesus, right? You know, Rome, Romans yeah. 6. Yeah. So through baptism, we die to sin. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that we can now live in the resurrection life of Jesus. So it's their challenges and battles, but that's the spiritual reality. This is so good. Dr. Brown, thank you so much. I love you with all my heart. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you just for any time I call, I text you. You're like, just give me a time and we get together. I'm, I'm so thankful to have you in my life and I really appreciate you. Hey, I will remain here, Todd. God bless you, man. Thank you. Bless you guys. All right. Bless you.